Hey friends, thank you so much for joining. Today's session is about healthy tech hacks for social distancing. I've spent my career studying the way technology influences how people think, feel, behave, and communicate. I've done this for some of the world's largest companies, from ad agencies to tech companies. I've worked at Apple, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, and a number of other places. And I found myself in the year 2016 working at Facebook. And while I was there, the 2016 election happened. And you might remember that was a moment in which we realized that suddenly social media was playing an even larger role in the course of human events than we ever thought before, because it was learned that perhaps Facebook played a role in allowing disinformation and propaganda to influence the outcome of the 2016 election here in the US. And when I heard this, it concerned me. And then when I saw the reaction of the leadership at the company, the way Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg so flippantly dismissed any possibility of that ever having happened, that really shocked me and led to me starting to pay more attention to the ways in which we were using the platform to influence the world. Um, this thing that I was helping to build, this thing that I was helping to work on and advance the mission of, I wanted to know what role it was playing in my own life. And I noticed as I paid attention to the way technology, in particular social media, showed up in my life, that it wasn't necessarily helping me live my life. Rather, it was distracting me more from my life, uh, more so than it was helping me. So. I decided to take action and do something about that. And I did um, a three month digital detox, even while I was working for one of the world's largest tech companies. And when I saw what happened when I removed as much technology from my life as possible, it created a lot of space in my mind uh, for lots of beautiful new things to emerge and for me to suddenly cultivate a greater sense of presence and capacity for dealing with life's challenges. I began to flourish in ways that people started to notice and asked me to start teaching them about. And so I did and realized this was something that Facebook should perhaps help its users understand how to use technology healthfully and in their best interests. I tried to raise awareness of this, but it didn't really go anywhere inside the company. In fact, things got worse while I was there. You might remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal where Facebook was held accountable for allowing all of our data to be released to third parties against its policies, against what was legal, against what was in our best interests. And it was at this point that I felt the need to really raise my hand and challenge what was going on inside the company. So face to face with Mark Zuckerberg at a large company meeting, I asked, when are we going to update our company values to reflect the positive kind of impact that we should be having in the world? We don't seem to be taking responsibility for that. As you might imagine, that was not well received and I'm giving you the short version of the story now, but eventually I learned that it was time for me to go and that having a positive impact on technology's role in our lives, specifically around social media, was gonna require me leaving the company in order to have some real impact. So in early 2019, I left my job at Facebook and launched Purposeful Digital Wellbeing. And for over a year now, I've had the great privilege of taking talks, workshops, seminars, private coaching to companies and families uh, all across the country and now the globe. At the end of 2019, I found myself speaking at the World Economic Forum about this topic. And so I've had a chance to apply this knowledge and really lead some transformation for a number of wonderful organizations that I've worked for and collaborated with. So it's been a fantastic year. It's uh, the work that I'm doing here has won some tremendous accolades, whether it's from Harvard Business Review or other media outlets, uh, getting to do a TEDx about this. Uh, this work is catching on. Digital well-being is catching on. And I'm so excited to share some of that with you here today. And why is it so important for us to be doing this right now? Well, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, in addition to everything that's happening out in the world right now with this pandemic, uh, we're seeing that social media and technology is playing a bigger role in our lives than ever. And while companies like Facebook are working entirely virtually right now, usage of its platform is soaring. And when I see headlines like this, it only reinforces the need for my work in this world and helping people understand how to use technology healthfully. Uh, technology is not the enemy, uh, but it does come with some habit forming risks uh, and risks to our well being. And so uh, I'm here to help teach how to mitigate some of those risks. In some of my other sessions, I go way deeper into 
what is the real threat of technology in our lives and is it actually a bad thing or not? And I'll skip over that for the sake of getting into the action items of this session. But I will touch on the fact that the technology that we carry with us every day in our pockets, on our smartphones, on our computers, through our social media apps, it is designed not with our best interests in mind, though the companies would tell you that. Uh, there are examples. If you take a look at Facebook's 2016 internal memo from their head of product, talking about how our mission is so good in this world that any tactics we use to keep people using our platform and signing up for our platform are inherently good doesn't matter the means or the lengths to which we have to go to acquire users or get them hooked on our platform. We think it's good for them, so we're just going to keep doing it. That was the mentality inside these companies. And we can see what's happened. The World Happiness Report from last year shows us that as internet hours have climbed over the past 10 years, we see time spent sleeping and in-person social interactions and happiness levels have declined at the same but opposite rate. So not great, but it doesn't mean technology is inherently evil or bad. Yes, it has habit-forming qualities that need to be uh, removed from the products and, and should not be legal to implement, but we have the power to control technology and, and employ it in our best interests. This is where digital well-being comes in, and this is what I teach, this is what I preach. Uh, so I want to talk about what digital well-being is and how it frames the topic of the day. Digital well-being means using technology in ways that serve your mental, emotional, and physical health. And when I say technology, I mean things, everything from like your smartphone and apps to Netflix, online services, social media, games, smartwatches, all these things. We should be using a lens to understand well, should we be using them or not? Should we buy them or not? Um, based on whether or not we can see a very clear uh, way that it serves our mental, emotional, and physical health on the whole. There are some things like Facebook that may serve a, a powerful use in your life, but may also come with an emotional downside to it. So we really have to be conscious of how that plays out. And that's what the practice of digital well-being is like. So how do you apply this? How do you cultivate digital well-being in your life? Well, it's regularly thinking about how can I intentionally use technology in service of either my needs, my values, or my aspirations. Aspirations being What's the kind of life I want to live? What are the things I want to accomplish? And underneath that are those needs. What do I need in order to thrive, in order to be fulfilled in life, in order to be safe and healthy in life? And my values, what kinds of experiences and things and ways of being do I value in my life? If we can use technology intentionally in service of these things, then we have a, a sense of digital well-being in our lives. And the opposite of this, the way most of us use technology now, is as a habitual distraction from our needs, values, and aspirations. It's so easy at the end of a long day to just plop down on the couch and start scrolling endlessly through our feeds uh, in avoidance of any of the things that we'd rather be doing that would serve us, or maybe the things that are hard to deal with, like difficult emotional barriers that are keeping us to from doing our life's work or deepening our relationships with people we care about. It's so easy to tune out through these devices. So I want to share a number of hacks for both mindset and technology that will allow you to overcome the hurdles of unhealthy technology use and start employing technology in service of the kind of life you really want to live. So let's begin. I'm going to start with mindset hacks before we get into the technology itself. Five ways of shifting your mindset to start using technology in a healthful way without changing a thing about the technology itself. So, number one, I want to offer you this. Our phones are first and foremost a utility. They're not an endless buffet of entertainment. It's a reframe. We're using them as this hybrid, this combination of utility or tool um, for navigating life, staying in touch with people, finding directions to things, um, looking up information that we need. Uh, but it also comes with this bottomless bowl of digital Doritos that is social media and Netflix and YouTube, which gives us access to an endless stream of entertainment. And so we found ourselves with um, this, this endless supply of distraction in our lives. If you reframe your mindset about what is the purpose of this phone in my life, uh, 
Is it for endless entertainment or is it to help me live my life better? Is it to be a utility? And when you reframe your values around your tech use in that way, it starts to help answer the questions of how should I be using this differently and what are the healthy settings for me uh, and apps for me to have on that phone or whatever device. Another thing I want to offer in terms of shifts, we get to decide when to pay attention to our devices. We don't have to allow the devices to tell us when to pay attention to it. Right now, most of us are using our devices in a way where it buzzes, dings, notifies us, tells us when to bring our attention to it. It doesn't have to be that way. We can turn all of that off or ignore those things and decide how often and when we want to be checking those devices to see if there's urgent and important things to deal with. So I wanna reframe that relationship from one where the phone tells you when to pay attention to it to one where you decide when and how much attention you're going to give it. Because, that leads us to the next point here, how we spend our time in life reflects our reverence for life. Time is, the only thing that you can't get more of. Time is the most valuable asset in the world. Time is something that, whether you're a billionaire, you can't get more of it. Uh, there's no amount of money that can buy you more time. And so how we use every moment of our lives really reflects the value we see of our lives and the time that we have. So that applies to you know those moments when we're mindlessly scrolling through our feeds or checking for likes and comments and shares or binge reading the news. Spend your time in a way that will make you proud. Spend your time in a way that shows your reverence for this gift of life that you have. Next. So when you are spending time with digital devices, you are consuming different kinds of experiences. Maybe it's reading the news, maybe it's scrolling through a feed, maybe it's watching funny cat videos on Instagram, whatever it might be. The content that you consume is like food for the heart and mind. So the same way you can nourish your body with a healthy meal of food, you're nourishing your heart and mind, your soul, with what you consume through content and experiences of life. So it's really important that we are mindful about what we allow into our minds. And lastly, the most important thing for navigating all of this what we pay attention to becomes our lives. Your attention is the one instrument nature has given you for navigating your consciousness through life. What you pay attention to becomes your life. So it's really important that we apply our attention very carefully. And I like to think of my attention as the needle on a record player, that's that stylus that you drop on a record for the music to play. Where you drop the needle of your attention determines what music gets played in your life. An interesting metaphor. Instead of allowing other things to determine where that needle goes, other things being the buzzes, dings, and notifications of your phone, social media posts, social media feeds that want to guide us through our day so that Facebook can show us more ads and make more money, instead, we can choose where to apply, apply our attention. When I look back on how I spent my time in life, what I applied my attention to, I want to feel good about the music that got played, metaphorically speaking. When I realized this, I decided I want to be the DJ of my life. I want to decide where my attention goes, where I drop the needle on that record and what song gets played. So that's some mindset hacks around this thing that will help you even in the, the decisions you need to make about technology that I don't talk about here today, some of those mindset shifts go a long way to helping reframe your relationship with technology. Okay, next, let's start getting more tactical and talk about habits. So the first thing I'm gonna recommend in terms of habit hacks is simply start being mindful of how you're spending your time with technology. This is where it all begins. You can't create change of your habits or your behaviors if you don't have awareness of them. And so we'll talk about some tactics for how to do that, but it really begins with knowing how much time do I even spend with this stuff? And is it a healthy amount? So when I first began this journey, I just spent a couple of weeks paying attention to how much time I was giving to technology, how much time was I spending with my face in a screen or with earbuds in listening to podcasts, and broke down that time into different kinds of activities from creative to productive to just consuming. And I found that most of my time was spent in consumption mode. So I started implementing some um, limits on my screen time and, and that sort of thing. And screen time is a big thing that comes up around this issue. 
uh, it can be an indicator of where we are applying the power of our attention with our devices. And so if you have an iPhone or an Android, you can go into your settings app and on an iPhone, you're looking for the screen time settings. On an Android, you're looking for the digital well-being settings. And you can actually take a look at, on an average day, how much time are you spending on your device? And what are you doing in that time? So you can see your most used apps and that sort of thing. And this is a great indicator to know, like, do I have a healthy relationship with this or not? Am I spending too much time on my screen or not? Uh, and the answer to that question is gonna be different for everyone because it depends on how you're using it. Screen time by itself isn't a helpful measure of digital well-being, uh, especially now that we're practicing social distancing and finding ourselves in lockdown in the same environment where we don't have access to our friends and family like we used to. We need technology for this. We need screen time to see each other, to be in touch with each other, and that's okay. But if the amount of time you're spending with your device doesn't feel good when you look at it and see that number, then it's time for a change. And so what might be you know, totally fine for one person, another person might say like, oh, that's, that's way too much time. I've got to cut back on this. I have more important stuff to do with my day. And so how do you do this? Here's what this looks like to start keeping an eye on your screen time. Uh, there are a number of resources for it. And so uh, on an iPhone, if you go into the settings app, you can go into screen time. And here you'll be able to say, see how much time you're spending today. Uh, how much time you spent in the last seven days and a number of other metrics that allow you to see, you know, by category. And then really importantly, what are you spending that time doing? And so if your top uh, most used apps on your phone or top most used websites, websites show up on here too. If you see it's stuff like this, you know, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, unless you're using it for creativity or giving the gifts of, you know, whatever you teach, maybe you're a, a meditation teacher and hosting lots of live broadcasts on Facebook and YouTube to teach people remotely right now. That's wonderful, but most of us aren't doing that. So spending a lot of time on these apps might not be serving you. I'm gonna ask you to check that out and also implement some screen time limits, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. Uh, on an Android, you go into the settings app and find the digital well-being panel, and you have very similar controls to what you see here on the iPhone. And then with uh, the Facebook app and the Instagram app, two of the, the big time consumers these days, um, you have the ability to get even more fine-grained controls over how you spend your time on these apps. You can actually put some limitations in place, some reminders to get off, uh, and a number of other wonderful things. So grab a screenshot of this or write it down. Uh, I can send it to you later if you'd like. And uh, this is a great way to start noticing and putting some limits on your screen time. Speaking of screen time and habits, please don't binge watch the news right now. <laughs> this is general advice I give in all of my workshops. It's evergreen advice. Don't binge watch really anything. Uh, but particularly right now, it's important that we don't get caught up in the endless cycle of the news that's out there right now. So some recommendations around this. Set a daily limit on your news consumption. So decide right now how much time you will want to maximize or you want to maximally spend on the news every day. So for me, my limit is 10 minutes a day at max. I some days don't look at the news at all. In fact, I get around looking at the news by subscribing to important updates from the government, both the federal and local level governments and the CDC. And they send me everything I need to actually know because most of the rest of the stuff that you see in the news right now isn't useful to you. And it's really just stressing you out. And now's not the time to be overly stressed out. If you're a first responder, if you're caring for someone who's ill, if there's someone in your family who is ill, that's a different story. But if you are on this webinar or you're tuned in on Facebook Live right now, well, you're well enough to, to start peeling back from the negativity in the news right now. You're not a first responder that needs to know every little detail about what's going on. You need to know how to stay healthy, protect yourself and care for others. And that doesn't come from binge watching the news every day. So I'm gonna recommend subscribing to some um, push notifications via text or whatever app of choice from your local government or other institutions that are just giving the essential information you need to thrive. And uh, maybe just subscribe to one or two daily news roundups. Listen, the news that you listen to today, the way things are changing, tomorrow, all of the things that you listened to yesterday aren't true anymore. The situation has changed. So don't waste your time 
absorbing information that is going to be untrue and outdated the next day anyway. Use your time right now in a way that will make you proud. Don't get hooked on the, the glossy, gross, gory details of the current situation. It's time for us to use our time very well. Uh, the Week and NPR offer some daily roundups that you can subscribe to. Actually, The Week offers a weekly roundup, hence the name. Uh, it's in print or digital, and this is a wonderful way to limit your news consumption and have it delivered straight to you when it's time to check it out. The Week comes in a print version or a digital version. I love the print version, and it's a great way to just get a digest of what you need to know from The Week. Um, most of us don't need to read the news every day. Now is a little bit different, where we want some updates from our government about how to stay safe and, and major developments in the current situation um, to keep us safe while there's this outbreak. But uh, generally, most people, most of us, don't need to read the news more than once a week to really be an informed citizen. Um, so ask yourself, what am I going to do with this information that I'm reading? How is it helping me be a better citizen or better person or live a better life? Okay. Now let's move on to the big one. A lot of you have been asking, how do I filter the information that's coming into my life? I use social media to receive my news. I am hearing all kinds of negative stories. I'm blah, blah, blah. How do I filter this out of my life and focus on the positive? Well, first of all, I'd say, don't get your news through social media. That's a terrible place to be getting your news. Uh, we just talked about some great habits to have around news consumption. But if you are going to stay tuned into social media at this time, I'm going to show you how to prune your feeds on social media so that you only see the stuff that you want to see. And ideally, you're pruning your feed so that only positive, uplifting, inspiring, and useful things are showing up in that feed from people that you care about or people that you respect or leaders or groups or communities that you belong to there. There are great ways to totally tailor the newsfeed experience in a way that helps you um, thrive and actually make social media a useful tool in your life. We're going to do a breakdown of how to do this on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn in one of the following sections. But this is one of the tactics I wanted to highlight while we're talking about habits, social media being a big habit that we have right now. The last habit before we get into changing settings and social media and that sort of thing, I want to say put on some happy music, make a happy playlist or subscribe to someone else's, create a shared playlist on a service like Spotify and invite your family members or friends or loved ones or coworkers and colleagues to contribute to that playlist. Only good vibes, uh, music that makes you want to dance, that makes you want to sing, um, sounds that will fill your home and your heart with joy. Right now, it's important that we shape our home environment. Wherever we are spending this time in social isolation, it's important that we find ways to cultivate a healthier home environment. And the music that we bring into our lives right now is such an important part of that. Um, a wonderful coach uh, friend of mine um, once told me that if you tend to listen to sad music, you're going to find yourself feeling sad more often than you would otherwise. If you find yourself listening to happy music, you're going to feel happier than you would otherwise. It's dead simple, but we don't think about that a lot. So if you've been tuning into like the mopey songs that I, I mean, personally, I love some of those. I'm a big Depeche Mode fan. Some of that stuff gets pretty dark. Sounds great. Very dancey, but not necessarily uplifting. I've created a number of playlists that uh, instead of raising the levels of doom, gloom, and negative energy that I feel uplift my energy and make me want to sing and dance. And here's a great example of one that I've been using for years called Get Up on Spotify, which you can subscribe to and add to your Spotify account by following this link here. It's all yours. Enjoy and uh, hope it inspires some of your own playlists for that sort of thing. Okay, let's move on to hacks for your devices and apps. Starting with those alerts, those buzzes, dings, notifications, little red dots that uh, stress us out and keep us tapping on things that actually aren't very important to us. Um, those little red dots are like little candies for your brain and it's trying to like draw you in to click on whatever app shows those things. Take a look at your email app right now. I'll bet most of us out there have hundreds of unread messages, or at least tens of unread messages. If you've got a little 45 red badge on your, uh, your inbox app right now <laughs> for email, like that's a little crazy. How's that number even useful to you? 
Uh, we get so much email these days. It's time to turn off the little red dots. It's time to turn off the notifications that draw us into things that aren't relevant to us and are just a distraction from what's important to us. Here's how to do that and some guidance on what to do about it. Turn off all notifications and red dots that aren't related to urgent and important things in your life. This is something that is dead simple, but few of us have done. Prune those notification settings. So whether you're on an Anf Android or an iPhone, if you go into your settings app and then go into notifications, you can turn off all the notifications that your phone sends you, whether it's little push updates with little banners that show up on your lock screen or slide down from the top, it's the little red dots, it's the sounds, it's the buzzing. You can turn all of this off um, per app or in one fell swoop, which is really wonderful. So if you go into the settings app, go into notifications, this is what it looks like on an iPhone, you'll see all your apps and you can go off, you can go in these apps and hit a button that inside of them that just turns off those notifications for it. It's really wonderful. And so, you know, there are lots of apps that can't wait to send you notifications like Yelp and maybe your yoga app or YouTube or Zipcar. You have to decide, are, are these an app? Is this an app that I actually want vying for my attention or should it just be there when I decide I need it? You know, your telephone app, you want that buzzing, dinging, ringing uh, when you have your, your notifications turned on, right? So um, make sure that that's working. Make sure that maybe your texting app is enabled, um, but disable some of the stuff that's just unnecessary. Uh, you don't need it, particularly around email. I wanna talk about this because so many folks have these big stressful numbers on their inbox app and they're getting these, these constant buzzes and vibrations and sounds um, that are telling them that they're getting email. Um, but they never catch up. They never actually read all of these emails or um, you know, there's just so many coming in that it doesn't matter to be notified. Literally every time you pick up your phone, there's gonna be another notification or another email waiting for you. So turn off those notifications for email altogether. And then um, on Android and iPhone, there are ways to make it so that certain people when they send you an email, you'll get the little red dot counter for them. So you can see how many important emails you've received as designated by certain people. So maybe it's an important client, maybe it's an important family member who sends you really essential emails uh, and, and you wanna be notified when they send you an email, but most of the junk that you get in your inbox even from colleagues, even from you know people that might play a big role in your life, but it's not urgent and important stuff. And you can learn about it when you decide to check your phone. You don't need your phone telling you to check it. But there are some of those things that you do want to bring your attention to as soon as it happens. And so there's a way to do that. On an iPhone, um, any of your contacts in your address book, you can designate as a VIP if you go into your contact settings and, and change that. And then if you go into your email settings, which I have here, if you go into settings, the settings app, then go into mail uh, and go into notifications, you'll find this little section here called VIP. And you can decide when those VIPs actually send you a note, what kind of notifications do you want to get? And maybe this is the occasion in which you get a badge. Now me, I currently have, um, as of, you know, right before I went on this uh, broadcast, I had seven, the little seven icon on my iPhone app. And that told me that there were seven important people in my life who had sent me an email that I needed to follow up on. That's way more useful than what would be otherwise. Unless you're an inbox zero kind of person, this is a great hack for staying in touch just enough, allowing your phone to nudge you just enough without it taking over your life with all those emails and stressing you out. Next, uh, let's talk about some of these habits that are more about making your phone a little more mindful. So uh, three simple things that I'll walk you through here. One is making your lock screen on your phone and a place for inspiration and uplift. Uh, maybe putting a mantra on there or some kind of personal reminder that you want to start thinking about. Because we pick up our phones on average 150 times a day when things are normal. We're checking our phones way more than average now, most of us. So what would happen if you use those 150 times a day plus to remind yourself of something really positive, to start cultivating certain habits or mindsets or values you want to start embodying and embracing in your everyday life? Or maybe there's a mantra or an intention you're trying to call into your life right now. Put that on your home screen. Instead of a, a distracting picture or a fun, entertaining thing, 
Put something that's going to actually lift you up and inspire you, especially at a time like right now. So, you know, some people put qualities like this on their phone, you know, things they want to be embodying every day. They get reminded of this 150 times a day when they look at their phone instead of just the, the notifications. Wonderful, simple thing to do. I'll show you how. Uh, the other thing is streamlining your apps. So limiting the number of things that appear on your, your uh, phone when you unlock it. Most of us just have like this whole litany of apps filling up the screen from top to bottom. And it's just this random, you know, jumble in the order that they got installed in. And there's all those little red dots and notifications and colors and things that are enticing you to click on them as soon as you open your phone. And a number of times I've seen people open their phone and just start swiping through the pages and pages of apps they have looking for something that they want to tap into not really having a really clear intention. Well, I was talking before about thinking of your phone as a utility rather than a bottomless source of entertainment. Well, start designing the layout of your phone to reflect its utilitarian role in your life. One of the things you can do is to streamline the apps that appear on your screen so that it's really just the most essential apps that are the primary things you want to be using your phone for and are maybe just the most frequently used apps on your phone. Uh, this minimizes visual distraction and noise. So our lives are already so cluttered with information and, and stimulus coming at us from all directions. This is a great way to simplify something you look at 150 times a day. So get rid of unnecessary apps, tuck them away in a folder on a second page, maybe next to your settings app, and hide those non-essential apps that you need them, but they're not that important. Keep them out of your face. Don't get into that mode where you're scrolling and just hunting and pecking for something with a red dot to click on. This is a great way to clean up your phone. And in fact, this is what my phone looks like. This is my lock screen. This is what I see when I unlock my phone. And this is the one extra page of apps that I have. Everything's buried in here. And if I wanna find something, I've added some friction. You know, I don't really keep social media apps installed on my phone uh, unless I'm taking screenshots for a demo like this. Um, but if I did, they'd be tucked away in here. And it adds a few steps to getting to time-wasting apps. Um, and you know, it forces me to search for them instead. So I pull down from the top and I type in what I'm looking for and it comes up that way instead of just allowing myself to mindlessly graze across a whole smorgasbord of apps on my screen. So this is a great way to do that. And I also filled in a bunch of blank spaces here on my iPhone. Uh, and this was just a, a way to keep my apps within reach, closer to the thumb, minimize the distraction, put some intentions on here. Um, and you know, you notice I use a black background to make the phone um, as, as neutral as possible. I don't want it to be a source of entertainment uh, or delight. That's what real life is for. This is a tool. I wanna make it as utilitarian as possible. So how do you do these things? Well, when it comes to adding um, text on the background of your lock screen or uh, wherever you keep your apps, there's this great tool from Adobe that allows you to do that called Spark. And if you go to spark.adobe.com, uh, you can download this app for your phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, they, they make it available. And you can create a distraction-free background. Maybe you go solid color. Maybe you go something really simple like water, uh, some kind of natural background that's um, not distracting, very neutral, and put something on there that you wanna do. When I first started my detox, um, I, the question that I was asking myself was, when I reach for my phone, what am I really looking for in this moment? And is it available to me in this little sliver of glass, steel, and aluminum? Or is it out here in the world? Or is it you know, from calling a friend and getting in touch or making plans with someone instead? So this was an app that allows you to, uh, to do that or, or does allow you to do that and, and put whatever reminder you want on your phone. Maybe you start with something like, what are you seeking as a way to ask yourself, am I mindlessly using my phone or is there some intention here behind why I'm reaching for it? And on other devices like your TV, uh, perhaps, you know, maybe you're not making a background for it, but you could put a post-it note on it. When I host these sessions in person, I give everyone one of these stickers, um, a reminder to cultivate presence in your life. Put it on your phone, on the back of your phone, or um, you know, tape it to the side of your monitor uh, at work or the side of your TV, or put a big post-it note there, which is something I did when I still had a TV. And it was a great way to remind myself, you know, I'd have to take that post-it note off there to, to turn on the television and watch it. Is this really the best use of my time right now or am I just distracting myself from my life? Sometimes we deserve to watch some Netflix. Sometimes that is the right use of time. Um, but so often we find ourselves avoiding or distracting ourselves from what we should really be doing, especially at a time like this. 
Uh, and then the other thing I was suggesting was uh, focusing your home screen on utilities. So really streamlining those apps. So go ahead and do a whole audit of the apps on your phone. Uh, scroll through and just start deleting the ones that you don't really need. Um, and, and start organizing them a little better. Make that first screen that you see really about the apps that are the most important to you and most utilitarian. Don't have social media or news apps on your main screen. You don't want them beckoning for your attention right away when you jump into this. Save it for communication tools like your phone and texting and email, maps for navigating, your calendar for staying on top of your agenda, maybe the weather, transportation apps or wellness apps, things like that. Um, so really uh, embrace that utilitarian approach to it. And then use a tool like uh, makeover.io. This allows you to put some you know, uh, dead space here. Like there are invisible icons here that makeover generated for me. You upload a screenshot of your phone and it turns it into these little icons that you can put here. Great way to organize your apps on an iPhone. Um, on an Android, you don't need makeover.io. You can just naturally do this, which is really nice. And when it comes to um, streamlining your apps, Please remove or replace apps that send you down the rabbit hole of distraction. So your social media apps, um, all of these services, Facebook, Instagram, maybe not so much Snapchat, but most of our social media apps and distracting apps like YouTube can be accessed through a browser on your computer. So uh, do you really need to have 24 seven access to your social media presence? Is it really that important that you can check for the latest likes, comments, shares, or funny cat videos? Uh, it, it's, it's so weird that we carry this with us more than we uh, carry around our wallets or our keys or really important things in our lives. We have access to our social media 24-7 and other irrelevant, you know, non-essential apps and forms of distraction. Experiment with what it's like to not have the apps on your phone. I'm not saying delete your account necessarily. I'm saying just delete the apps and rely on the website, either through your mobile browser on your phone or... Maybe you decide, you know what, the only time I'm gonna use social media is when I'm sitting down at my computer, whether it's my laptop or desktop. Um, and that's, that's, you know, it'll be a session. I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna log in intentionally, <laughs> log in, uh, use it and then move on with my life. Uh, and I only do it when I'm seated at a desk. Or if I use it on my phone, it's only through a browser, which makes it a little slower, add some extra steps and friction to it, which is a great thing to do, to add some space and time there for you to ask, is this a good use of my time right now? Do I have a clear reason for getting on here or am I just trying to waste time again? Great thing to do. And then when I say uh, replace apps, uh, I'm talking about this last bullet here, using focused apps from the major social media companies. Like Facebook makes an app called Local uh, and you know its messenger app is, is broken out all by itself too. So it's a great, those are great tools to keep on your phone instead of the main Facebook app. And so you know what that looks like, here's the local app. And this is very relevant to us right now as we're practicing social distancing. If you download this local app, it's really just the Facebook events feature of the Facebook app. Uh, so you can see events happening around you, events you've RSVP'd to or have been invited to. And right now, all these events are virtual. Some of them are local to your community, some might be global, some might be from your friends. And this is a great way to um, see what virtual events are happening in the world right now. Uh, so you can just fire up this app and find ways to connect with people in more meaningful ways than endlessly scrolling through a feed. Great. So let's take a look at some tools for focus. Um, I talked about time limits before, um, and there's a number of other tools to implement uh, here. So here's one that's really fun. Here, it's a, it's a cute way of shifting some of your unhealthy habits around your phone use. Let's say you're trying to get something done or trying to keep the phone away. Um, you can download Forest app. It works on Android and iPhone. And it's a little app that you have to keep running on your screen uh, and you plant a virtual tree and uh, when you plant this tree, you commit to a certain period of time that you want to be productive. And while it, that, that clock counts down, this tree grows from a little seedling up to a fully you know, grown tree. And uh, over time, as you grow these trees, they become a little forest that you can keep an eye on. And it, it accounts how much time you're spending on purposeful activity uh, that you commit to. Now, how this works is if you close the app, um, the tree dies 
So, you know, if you close the app before the time runs out uh, that you're meant to be productive in, <laughs> you start checking your, your Facebook or responding to texts, the tree dies. And that's what this screen is here. This poor little tree didn't make it um, because you decided to switch over to, um, you know, TikTok or something to see a funny video when you were supposed to be working or spending time with your family. Uh, this is a fun little psychological motivator to really take those breaks from your phone uh, and be productive or be present for the people around you. Uh, a tool that a lot of authors, writers, professional writers uh, swear by are these two. Uh, one is called Self-Control, works for Macs. And then there's another one uh, called Freedom that works on Windows or Mac. And this is if you're sitting down to really do some intentional work. Maybe you, you need to spend this afternoon really building the next presentation for your online seminar and you need to be free of distractions like Facebook or the news or things like that. And you haven't yet cultivated that self-control to resist those things. This is a way to put some boundaries on what you can do on your computer. So they work very similarly. Here's an example from self-control. Oops. Um, what you do is you create a blacklist of websites that um, are really addictive for you and that you regularly check and feel like a waste of time or might just be a distraction when you're trying to be productive. Once you have that list together, you then get this little window here uh, where you select how long do you want this tool to block you from being able to visit those sites. Um, on any browser that you use, on any app that's on your computer, won't be able to access these things. It really edits some low-level settings of your computer that can't be bypassed by any other means. So when you set that time and hit the start button, let's say for an hour, you're not going to be able to get to those websites for that hour. There's no way to get around it. You could restart your computer. You could uninstall the app. There's no way to allow yourself to visit these sites during that time. It's a really powerful tool. And when I really need to hunker down and get some work done, you better believe I'm firing up self-control and blocking those addictive websites. Same thing works with freedom.to. You can get these apps there. Highly recommend. Uh, another tool for focus uh, built into the operating system of iPhones. Uh, there's also a similar thing to this on Androids um, under the screen time settings that we were talking about before. There's a section called app limits. So this is in your settings app, screen time, app limits. And when you tap into here, what you can do is you can add limits for certain categories of apps and websites or uh, specific apps. So uh, here's a, uh, an example of someone who has set 15 minute limits every single day on their time on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, great way to say like, look, I want a little social media in my life, just like I want a little bit of dessert with every meal uh, or some candy, but I don't want it to be the way I spend most of my time every day. This is an awesome way to set those limits. And what happens is that uh, screen comes up after you hit the limit and says, hey, you've maxed out on your time for this app. Um, move on with your life. You can hit a snooze button um, or you can lock down your settings even harder and uh, make it so that you can't bypass that. Great built-in tool for focus though. Let's talk about calendar apps now, some tips for this. So a lot of us uh, who work in corporate environments in particular end up with calendars that often look like this, where your entire day uh, from 9 a.m. until quitting time is this um, densely packed web of meetings that other people probably put on your calendar. Things overlap and conflict and no one really respects your time. They're just inviting you to a meeting that they want you to be at and we kind of let it happen. This is not a great way to be managing our time. Now more than ever, since we have less structured days, less structured environments, it's important that we be disciplined in how we think about spending our time every day and planning in ahead, in advance, how we want to spend our time every day. So a typical Monday might look like this. Well, Ben Franklin had the right approach, and I recommend all of us doing something like this in our calendar apps of choice. Uh, ben Franklin would sit and, and uh, or had this structure for how he would spend his time every day. And, you know, what the work was or the, the time spent with um, friends for high quality leisure time, you know, that would change. But the time of day that he did it in didn't change. And this was a great structure for his day, including asking himself questions at the beginning of the day that allowed himself to 
to get grounded before he even began the unfolding of the day. He would ask himself, what good shall I do this day? And at the end of the day, he would bookend it by asking, what good have I done this day? Great way to take stock of our reverence for life based on how we're spending our time. I remember I was talking about that at the beginning of the session. This is so important. And so use that calendar app of choice and start mapping out, just blocking off time for when do you need to be doing work with colleagues? Uh, When do you need to be working solo on work that is just your output, maybe building a presentation or working on a spreadsheet or writing some important emails or tending to some uh, home improvement stuff or cleaning things up? Put that on your calendar. And don't let people book over that time. Uh, Respect it, whether you're working from home or just managing your home, it's really important that we build some structure into our days. Um, That masterclass that I'm teaching uh, that I uh, told you at the beginning of the call, that's coming up soon. We're gonna do a whole deep dive into how to apply this into your calendar, how to apply this into your life and, and start making this a regular practice. I'm really looking forward to that. So if this is something that you're interested in, definitely sign up for that masterclass on my website. All right, the moment I know a lot of you have been waiting for. How do you control the flow of information into uh, your world, into your consciousness, particularly when it comes to social media? I wanna show you now how to prune your social feeds for the four major social media apps that we waste a lot of our time on. You have the power to control what shows up in your feed. That could mean that you, you want to see nothing in your feed and you only want to use these apps for finding people, looking at profiles, checking out events. You don't want a bottomless bowl of posts uh, to scroll through in that feed. Uh, you could even go that far. Or you could just narrow it down to only the, the good stuff that you want to see. Here's how to do that. Let's start with Facebook. So uh, this feature has been around for a while, but not a lot of people know about it. Um, I actually taught a workshop on this at Facebook and no one there knew (laughs) that this was a feature of the platform. It was really funny. I showed them how to prune their feed. And so on the Facebook website, you can do this through the website or the app. It's way easier on the website. um, So I'll show you how to do it on both. To find the settings that you need to do this, On the website, it's under that little triangle menu in the top right corner, uh, and then you click on Newsfeed Preferences, and that'll take you where you need to go. On a phone, it's a little more complicated. So um, if you've got the Facebook app open, you go to the little hamburger menu, which is on the bottom on an iPhone. I think on the Android, it's on top. But go into the little main menu, and then scroll down until you see Settings and Privacy. Click on that, and it'll expand, and it'll show you all this stuff you wanna click on settings. And once you get there, you wanna scroll down, way down, they really buried it, to newsfeed preferences. And once you get there, you wanna click on unfollow people to hide their posts. And whether you've done this on the browser on your computer or in the app, what you'll find next is a very, is, is similar across both of them. You'll have that unfollow people in groups option. Click on that. And what you'll get is this menu that allows you to view literally every person, page, or group that you follow on the platform. And what you can do is just hover your mouse over any one of them, and when you click on them, it unfollows them, and it'll gray them out. So you can narrow down, you know, this, this could take a while. When I first did this, it took me 45 minutes of clicking, but that 45 minutes that I put in years ago has paid dividends over the years since I've done that because my Facebook feed is full of very few people and it's all uplifting, inspiring, and useful stuff. It totally transformed my relationship with Facebook. Uh, to be much better. And so, you know, here's an example of of some of the folks that I follow in my feed that actually show up. And it's, you know, as you can see, like positive, good stuff and family, that's my sister there. Uh, The joy list for discovering wonderful communities and events that I can be a part of in New York or now virtually uh, and things like that. So wonderful way to control what shows up in your feed. And you could actually do this in a way where you uncheck everything and after a couple of days of Facebook showing you all the stuff that it had in store for you, uh, you'll get down to newsfeed zero. 
This I did the very first time and it was so amazing to open up the Facebook app and to see nothing but the prompt for what was on my mind. No posts waiting for me, no advertisements, nothing but pure Facebook utility. So I could find my contacts, I could see when people's birthdays were, I could look up events that I wanted to go to and get the logistical information, I could participate in the groups I cared about, but I didn't have a habit forming feed to tempt me into 20, 30, 60 minutes of distraction by accident just because I opened up my Facebook app to see the address for an event I wanted to go to or when someone's birthday was or whatever it might have been. This is a powerful shift in how you use a platform like Facebook in particular. I highly recommend trying this out. Next, let's talk about Twitter. So whether you're on the app or the website, uh, looking at any post in your Twitter feed, uh, you'll see this little V icon. And when you hover over it, a little menu appears and it allows you to mute the person who published that post. Uh, really straightforward way to do this. You can also do that sort of thing on Facebook. Uh, and it doesn't seem like Twitter has really given us a great tool for doing this en masse. Um, you can go into your list of people that you follow and um, hold down, if you're on a Mac, the Apple button and, or the Command button and just click, click, click on everyone that you follow and open them up into separate tabs and then one by one go in and hit the mute button on them so they don't show up in your feed. Uh, it takes a little more effort. They didn't make it as easy as Facebook did, but you have the option to do that. But, you know, instead of making that one big project, what you could do is just commit to, for the next month or so, every time you see something in your Twitter feed from someone who's nothing but a, a, a gloomy person, an Eeyore posting uh, negative stuff in your feed all the time, you can just make a habit of clicking that mute button whenever you see it. And over the course of a month, you will have dramatically increased the signal to noise ratio in a wonderful way um, so that you're seeing the stuff you really wanna see or more positive stuff. Now where Twitter does have a real power move that you can make here, um, in the app or on the mobile website, uh, you can go into settings, privacy and safety, and go into your muted section, and it'll show you which accounts you've muted. You can't, uh, it doesn't show you ones that you haven't muted, so it's not a way to start adding people uh, to it, but you can undo some of those mutes. By the way, all of these things are ways to keep connected to these people. They just don't show up in your feed. So you're not going to damage any relationships. No one knows this is happening to them um, except you. But the real power move here on Twitter is they have a second section here for muted words. So let's say you get really sick of hearing things about the virus that's spreading around the world right now. You don't want any notices about that, no tweets about that. You could actually go into this settings panel, muted words, hit the little plus button, and type in whatever keyword or phrase that you don't wanna hear from anymore, and hit the mute button uh, on it. So anyone, doesn't matter who it's coming from, uh, if they mention the word, let's say coronavirus, um, it won't show up anywhere you tell it not to show up. So you can hide it from your timeline. You won't receive notifications if someone uh, posts about it in a way that Twitter would have notified you about uh, and so on and so forth. And you can set time limits on this. So let's say for 30 days, you want no more tweets from um, anyone talking about the virus. You could set that up and say, you know what? I'm taking a month vacation from this. I don't want social media to be the source of my news about this. I'm gonna tune into the authorities about it. Boom, hidden. Uh, fantastic tool. Uh, Twitter is the only one that's currently offering something like this, and it's, uh, it's wonderful and powerful. Uh, let's talk about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has a good feature for this. Um, on the app or the website, uh, any post in your feed has this little three-dot menu. If you click on that, you'll see this option down here, improve my feed. Click on that. And uh, inside of there, you'll be able to tap on the, the, the folks that you're following. Um, I only follow 139 people out of the thousands of people I'm connected to. These are the folks, some of the folks that show up in my feed. Uh, what I could do and what I had done a long time ago is uh, went through everyone that I was following and checked or unchecked uh, the following button, or in this case, it's now an unfollow button. So you can just go through, boom, 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 scroll, boom, 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 and unfollow all these people. Um, that were, you know, 
the people that you don't want to follow. Uh, some of us want to get down to a newsfeed zero, so nothing shows up in the LinkedIn feed that would distract you. LinkedIn still shows you ads, it still shows you sponsored content and other things like that, whereas Facebook really lets you get down to a newsfeed zero. Um, but this is a great way to remove noise, especially if, if you have people that are just really annoying on LinkedIn or bringing a lot of negative vibes or just talking about stuff you don't care about. Unfollow them. Filter that news out. Filter that noise out. Instagram also offers this. Uh, it's, it, it requires a few steps, um, but I'm pretty vigilant with it, uh, and you can be too. So on Instagram app, this really works best on the app, um, go to your profile, uh, in this case it's me, and then um, go ahead and click on that uh, following list, how many people you're following. It'll show you the list of everyone you're following. And then the little three dots next to them, you can tap on it, and this menu comes up that allows you to either manage the notifications that you get from that person, so you could really fine tune how much they do show up in your life through notifications or feed, or you can hit this mute button, and then it'll slide up with another menu and say, do you wanna mute their posts or their stories or both? And they don't know this is happening to them, but you can do this. And it'll really cut out the people that are posting 50 gajillion stories a day about their, you know, updates of what they're eating while they're in quarantine and all that, or whatever you don't want to hear from in your life right now. Um, you can tune that out, filter it out through this feature. So, you know, you can go through your following list and hit those three dots on everyone and change these settings. It's going to take some time if you follow a lot of people that you, <laughs> you don't want showing up in your feed anymore. But I promise you, uh, if your emotional and mental well-being is important to you, that uh, 30 or 40 minutes of editing this uh, will pay dividends for years to come. Highly recommend. Okay. So, friends, um, that's it for today. Those were some healthy tech hacks to practice while social distancing. These are the things that are gonna make your mental habits, emotional habits, uh, and your tech use a little healthier while we're spending more time using these devices. I wanna leave you with just a, a, a couple of reminders of what we talked about at the beginning of this session, some mental reframes to have around your attitude about the role the device plays in your life, whether it's your smartphone or your computer or your inbox or social media. Five things that if you reframe your mindset around them, you'll know how to do all of this, uh, even the things I didn't talk about today. This is your filter. Number one, your phone is a utility. It is not an endless buffet of entertainment. Reframe your mindset around that. Edit your apps accordingly. Delete Netflix off your phone. Um, save that for moments when you're really going to hunker down properly on the couch with with a screen um, that's not your phone. Don't fill your time with that unless you, you really have a specific need for that. Next, we get to decide when to pay attention to our devices. They don't tell us when to pay attention to them, okay? So right now, the default settings of your phone out of the box and probably the way you're using it now, your phone is constantly beckoning for your attention with all those buzzes, dings, and notifications. Turn those off and See what it's like to reframe your relationship with your technology in a way where you decide how often and how much you're going to pay attention to it. Powerful shift in the relationship from that. And then a mindset shift around how we spend our time because how we spend our time in life directly reflects our reverence for life. How grateful are we for the fact that we are alive right now? Our, the way we spend our time should reflect that, and it shouldn't be endlessly scrolling through cat gifs and memes on Instagram, unless that's serving a very specific intentional purpose, goal, aspiration, or need in your life. Maybe it does. Maybe you need a little uplift. That's great, but don't spend all day doing that. Next, uh, the content that we consume. I was talking about how that's like food for the heart and mind. So whatever you're reading on your screen, know that if you're reading stressful stuff all day, it's triggering that fight or flight response in your mind. What does that do? That sends stress chemistry coursing through your body. What does stress chemistry do? It prepares you to flee from imminent danger. Now, most of you who are tuning in from this, though there's a virus spreading out there in the world, you're in the comfort and safety of your home, thankfully social distancing yourself so that you don't get this thing. There's no imminent danger. Don't flood your body with stress chemistry because you know what it does? It weakens your immune system. It makes you age more rapidly. It makes you more susceptible to illness at a time when we need to be as immune and robust as possible to help flatten that curve. And then lastly, 
just that reminder that what you pay attention to becomes your life. Your attention is that one superpower that nature has given you for creating your life. What you apply your attention to over time becomes your life. Choose carefully what you apply your attention to and for how long, because that, when you look back on your life, is gonna determine how you feel at the end of your life about how you spent your time. So let's choose wisely. Let's use this time when we have this gift of extra time because we're not commuting as much, um, uh, maybe there's a little less responsibility at work, you have more time to spend with your family, whether it's homeschooling or just quality time, uh, let's use this time in a way that makes us proud. A little reminder that uh, right now, what's happening to us, you know, life in general, it doesn't happen to you. It is not a problem. Life is happening for you. Right now, this situation is nature grabbing us by the shoulders and saying, Hey, wake up, take a pause, reassess the way you're spending your time. Step out of your normal everyday habits and ask yourself, what, uh, what should I be doing with my time? Don't use this as a moment to just figure out ways to pass the time and fill your time mindlessly. Use this gift of time we've been given, this moment of reset that nature has forced us to embrace and apply it in a way that will make you proud. You're going to spend the rest of your life answering the question about how did you spend your time when the coronavirus hit in 2020? And you're going to want to feel good about your response to that question. Hopefully it's time used in a way where you are caring for yourself or your loved ones or finding a way to be of service to those around you or just um, cleaning up your act a little bit now that we have this time to reset and think more thoughtfully about that sort of thing. All right, I'll come down off the soapbox now. I just want to remind you about some upcoming events. Today was Healthy Tech Hacks. Tomorrow I'm talking about the concept of digital well-being during the coronavirus, specifically for families that are uh, wondering how to find that balance of working from home while also having kids around and keeping everyone safe and healthy with technology at a time like this. I'll be going live on the Robertson Center's Instagram handle. You can sign up for information about that on my website. Uh, and then I'm announcing this week um, the next masterclass that I'll be teaching. So if you want to take, you've already invested an hour of your time today learning about this, and maybe you've come to some of my other seminars, take that knowledge and apply it into action. Knowledge up here isn't the same as embodiment of that knowledge into practice that's relevant for your life and uplifting of your life. I'm going to go deep on just three topics in this masterclass, and we're going to work together in a small group to really put those ideas into action rather than just talking about them. It's going to be a powerful thing, and it's only 40 bucks to do this. You've already got, come this far. Time to invest a little bit into making it happen. So you'll leave that session with a real plan of action and real clarity on how you're gonna start acting, behaving, and using technology differently in your life. So sign up at purposeful.nyc slash masterclass for that. And uh, share these events with others. That's all I've got for today, friends. Um, now's the time for questions, if anything came up. Um, would love to hear what's on your mind. Um, would love to answer any questions, and I'll check the comments here and see if anyone left anything on the fly. Feel free to unmute and share. Maybe show your camera. Would love to see your face, especially now that, you know, I'm actually coming at you live from my childhood bedroom in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, instead of my home in New York City. So uh, welcome all of you on Facebook Live and on Zoom who are hanging out with me in my childhood bedroom. Uh, I'm here on video. I'd love to see your face here because I'm not going outside. Uh, I'm not able to connect. So feel free to chime in with any questions, comments, or other ideas you have about healthy tech hacks. Giancarlo, it's Brandon. Can you hear me okay? Hey, buddy. Great to hear your voice. What's up? I'm trying to figure out how to get the video, but I don't know. For some reason, it's it's being uh, fishy over there, but whatever. It's a beautiful day to be alive, um, as you know, in our neighborhood. And just wondering from your perspective, um, how have your habits and boundaries towards technology changed over the last two weeks? And then that was my question. And then a comment based on because you've been really helping me throughout the last whatever your your other sessions that I've been to as well um, I've been really exploring my own boundaries and one of the things mm. that I learned today on Twitter I don't know if you talked about it earlier but, but there's this hashtag it's called COVID kindness on Twitter and so whenever you need it's like a hack of positivity and kindness 
whenever you need to do that, it has a list of all like some really cool things that people have done to make others feel good. And that, that has helped me get off um, the negative anxiety of, of the news. So that was just oh. a, a tip there, but that was my question. What a great share, man. Thank you for bringing that to us. I love that. So there's a great hashtag or topic to be following um, if you're looking for some inspiration around what's happening in the world right now. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for coming to this session. And a uh, great question about how have my habits specifically changed. I'd say the biggest change has been that uh, I'm definitely spending more time with technology than I ever have before, um, but with clear intentions. So I am opting to use uh, video chat for all of my interactions with people. I have really dialed back the amount of text messages that I send uh, and have focused more on face-to-face um, -face interactions like this. Um, in some of my other sessions that you came to, you know I talk about the difference between digital connection, which is just the exchange of data, the exchange of language, uh, and boiling down social interaction to information, rather than the full visual experience like we're having right now, where you're seeing my gestures, my facial expressions, tone of voice, and when you're in person, you can also have physical contact and uh, even exper uh, experience each other's pheromones and all of these things. It's what most of the, the machinery up here, our brains, is evolved to process and be nourished by. And so when we opt for just digital communication uh, over text or social media, we're really distilling the human social experience down to this very narrow bandwidth interaction that isn't very nourishing for us. It doesn't make us feel good the way that seeing someone does, particularly in person. But barring that, I've opted for video chat. So I've been doing a lot of group hangouts. Um, I went to a dinner party. I've gone to group meditations. I've done fitness classes. I've um, had happy hour with friends. I've done one-on-ones. I've even gone on dates on um, video chat. And that's a big change that um, you know has happened where preferably I'm spending time face-to-face -face with people. Um, but that's not happening uh, now. So video chat has been the MO over the past two weeks. That's the biggest change. You don't set any limits on that, like for your own, like, because I know like when you talk about like, I, I love your, your, your food pyramid for technology specifically, but I know like in food restriction, just for that example, right? They always tell you how you shouldn't be like trying to restrict it. And so you don't have any restrictions on when you, when you, if it's a positive or, or, or inter, if it's a positive interaction with technology, you don't have any restrictions on that. Or do you cut it off for a certain amount of hours per day or something? Too much of anything, even a good thing, is still too much. So uh, there, I do put boundaries in place still um, around that, even though it's a good use, staying in touch with people and, and uh, having social experiences outside of my immediate environment. I am trying to be very careful about how much time I spend doing that because, um, you know, I, I do put limits on it. And particularly, I try to focus those interactions in my evenings. So I plan my day out the way that I was talking about before. And my, my mornings, I really try to focus on productivity, getting things done, sending important emails, working on presentations or um, doing coaching sessions or, you know, client engagements then uh, into the afternoon. And then I save my evenings for socializing and hanging out. So from happy hour onward, depending on the day, that's when I'm spending time with friends um, or, or, you know, joining in social gatherings that are happening virtually. And even then I limit that to a certain number per night or a certain amount of time per night. Because I know like staring at screens, even if it's a positive social interaction, it's just not physically good for me. Uh, I feel more tired when I'm having interactions, a lot of interactions spent staring at a screen than when I'm in person. And it just has an effect on me. So, you know, I've had to be very mindful of that. And now has been a time of experimentation for me in finding what is that right balance. My first week uh, in isolation, I overdid it on screen time. I was connecting with everyone uh, all the time, you know, back to back on video chats, whether it was FaceTime or Zoom. And at the end of those days, I was just so exhausted. And so now I've, I've gotten into a better routine. And this is something that I guide everyone. You probably heard in my last session um, that all of this is an experiment. If you choose to try a new habit out, uh, if you want to make a change, know that it's not forever. Treat it as an experiment. Do the research. See what works. And if it doesn't work, adapt. Uh, if it does work, fantastic. Maybe it just needs some fine tuning or uh, evolution. Experiment with it. So no, don't go whole hog on anything. Um, set some boundaries. Try it out. See how it serves you. Maybe a little more will be better. Maybe it's a little too much and you got to peel back. But it's a dance. 
we're always, you know, leading and following in different areas of our life. Same thing with our relationship to technology. Great question, man. Well, it's been a real pleasure. I hope you all are using your time in really wonderful ways right now. Uh, I hope you're finding that balance and that sense of thriving. Um, and thank you so much for the gift of your time today. I hope this was useful, valuable, uh, that you'll take this knowledge and share it with others. Um, I'll follow up with you uh, via email uh, to offer the instructions that we went through here today. And if you go to my website, purposeful.nyc slash numeral 10, ways, uh, 10 ways, you can um, find a guide to a lot of what we talked about here today that's already up on the website. So with that, I'll send you on your way. Be well, stay safe, and uh, embrace those healthy habits, friends. Until next time, bye.